And I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker. He was named this year as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. He's offered, he has authored over 140 scientific papers and he holds 16 US patents. Please welcome the John F. Elliott Professor of Materials Chemistry at MIT, Don Sadoway. Good morning. You know, the, uh, the electricity grid has been called by the National Academy of Engineering the greatest machine ever built. When I mean, you, you look at this image, whoops, I think I wanted the previous one of the, yeah. When you look at this image, you can see that electrification is tantamount to modernity. The dark areas are either uninhabited or impoverished. Remarkable as the grid is, it suffers from one important shortcoming. It lacks on a massive scale the ability to store charge. It's sort of like every time you want to take a shower, it has to be raining right then and there. You know, the electricity that's powering the lights in this theater was generated just moments ago. And, and this inability to store charge leads to consequences. It makes the grid fragile. It's susceptible to blackout, wide fluctuation in price. And we deal with this shortcoming by endowing the grid with a superabundance of generating capacity, 30%, 40% more than we need for average demand, just to meet that less than 1% of peak. So wasteful. What I want to talk to you about today is a solution to this problem. It's called the liquid metal battery. It's a device I invented at MIT, working with a team of my graduate students and postdocs. But before I dive into the chemistry of the liquid metal battery, let's set the stage. So I'm going to begin with a history lesson. The battery, you may not know, was invented by a professor, <laughs> Alessandro Volta. With this invention about 200 years ago, he gave birth to a new field of science, electrochemistry, and new technology, such as electroplating. Perhaps overlooked by historians is the fact that with this invention, Volta also, for the first time, demonstrated the utility of a professor. <laughs> Until Volta, no one imagined a professor could ever be of any use. So when we think about batteries today, I have some general rules that uh, I'd like to share with you. There's no right battery for all applications. It's all about the fit. So don't pay for attributes you don't need. So for example, a cell phone needs to be idiot-proof because by and large, it's in the hands of idiots. <laughs> the car, car needs to be crash-worthy. So people who say just take a whole bunch of lithium-ion batteries out of cell phones and put them in a car, aren't preparing for what we have to be responsible about, what would happen in a major collision. We can endow those batteries with crashworthiness, but it's going to raise the cost. And what about the service temperature? Well, it depends if the battery is going to be in contact with humans. Now, cell phones, laptops, yes, but stationary storage? Well, that can be in the basement, it can be off in another building. So you'd think, wow, that would give you much more freedom in chemistry. But the problem there is it's all about cost. And even though I'm a professor, I'm going to talk about cost. So let's talk about some real numbers here. When you buy a replacement battery for your laptop, you're paying probably something like $2,000 to $3,000 a kilowatt hour. That's for the capital cost of the battery. Your cell phone battery, if you replace it, it's about $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Now, if you want to get into all electric vehicles, the Threshold price point is $250 a kilowatt hour, and that's pretty high. Imagine you've got a 40 kilowatt hour pack on an all electric, $250 a kilowatt hour, that's $10,000 just for the battery. And if we're going to have an impact on air quality, imported petroleum, we've got to get a car on the showroom floor for $20,000, not $120,000. And you can't put a car on the showroom floor for $20,000 if the battery pack alone is $10,000. So that price has to come way, way down. And when it comes to stationary storage, grid-level storage, it's $100 a kilowatt hour. Super, super low price point. And 
the severity of service conditions increases from top to bottom. Grid level storage, massive currents, long service lifetime, laptop, computer, much more forgiving. Yet the price increases from bottom to top. So if you and I start a battery company, we're going to make batteries for toys because that's where the money is. But the societal need is at the bottom. And here's the evidence. This is giving you installed capacity as a function of price. And you can see it's a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. So every time you go up one line, you go up by a factor of 10. So that red dot is 1,000 times more than the orange dot, which is 1,000 times more than the bottom of the graph. Two takeaway messages here. Everything to the right of $500 a kilowatt hour doesn't count. It's all just noise. There's only one technology that works. It's pumped hydro. But, you know, I was looking out the window last night from my hotel. I don't see any mountains around here. And there are no mountains in downtown Boston, no mountains in Manhattan. So pumped hydro is geographically constrained. That's the polite term. Okay. When it comes to renewables, wind and solar, if they're going to contribute to base load, we have to address their intermittency. We need to be able to draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. And a battery can do that. But even on today's grid, as I mentioned earlier, the Electricity Storage Association defines 17 different values for storage. And it's not just for long-term storage. There's all these ancillary services like load leveling, load following, frequency regulation, spinning reserves, non-spinning reserves. These all have different functionalities, different time constants, different electrical signatures, but they all need a honking, big, cheap, battery. And for grid level storage, it's not my battery versus somebody else's battery. What do people do to fill the gap right now? They trot out a gas-fired peaking unit. They trot out a diesel-fired peaking unit. So it's battery versus combustion. So we need to think differently if we're going to invent against that. You've got an incumbent technology that's very cheap. And by the way, if I haven't told you enough already, I want to make it clear. Today's lithium-ion batteries fail badly here. Really bad. Not even close. And when we start looking for batteries that can work here, because of the scale, we're talking about tons and tons and tons of material. We have to stay away from certain parts of the periodic table. We have to look at only Earth-abundant elements because that's the only stuff that's going to be abundant, cheap, and scalable. How cheap? It has to be dirt cheap. And the only way I know how to make something dirt cheap is to make it out of dirt. <laughs> Preferably American dirt. That way, we've got a secure supply chain. It makes no sense to me to trade dependence on imported petroleum for dependence on imported cobalt. So, how do I come up with this liquid metal battery? Everybody else thinks about conventional batteries and how to make them bigger. And I took my inspiration from outside the field of energy storage. I looked to a device that doesn't store charge, doesn't produce charge, but instead consumes charge, vast quantities of it. I looked at an aluminum smelter. This is what an aluminum smelter looks like. This is row after row of cells drawing huge amounts of current. This is probably 500,000 amperes at 4 volts. This is about 50 feet left to right and recedes about a half a mile. If, you, if your eye's really good, you'll see off to the right in the background there's a human figure standing there. That'll give you a sense of it. And this draws current 24-7 and it converts dirt, aluminum oxide, into liquid aluminum. And I looked at this and I said, wow, I've been studying this for about 20 years at MIT before I started thinking about the battery. By the way, this technology was invented in 1886 by a couple of 22-year-olds, Charles Martin Hall in the United States and Paul Hirul in France. And as a result of this invention, they took something that's a common, that was a precious metal. Aluminum used to sell for more than the price of silver. There's a cap, a pyramid of 100 ounces on the top of the Washington Monument made out of aluminum because in 1876, aluminum was a precious metal, and they turned this into a cheap structural material. 
So you take bauxite from one corner of the globe, carbon, petroleum, coke, 14 kilowatt hours of electricity, $5,000 a ton capital cost, you make virgin metal for less than 50 cents a pound. This is a modern economic miracle. And I ask, how can I exploit that economy of scale and turn this smelter instead of in an energy sink into an energy storage device and an energy source? And I did. I conceived of the liquid metal battery. Three liquid layers, liquid metal on top, molten salt in between, and liquid metal on bottom. And it stores charge because the magnesium wants to react with the antimony, and the only way it can do so is to enter the electrolyte, and the only way it can enter the electrolyte is to send electrons through an external circuit. And the current passing between the electrodes keeps the battery at temperature. It requires no external furnace. We use insulation, of course. And then to charge the battery, you connect a power supply, and you refine the magnesium out of the antimony and send it back up to the top. And the magnesium is insoluble in the salt, and the salt is insoluble in the antimony, just like salad oil and vinegar. So these things stratify by density. They don't mix. There's no membranes. There's no separators. There's no solid. And it really works. And I got some seed funding at MIT that allowed me to go forward with this. So this is a cutaway, one of these cells. This is now frozen. Okay. At one point, it was molten. There's the magnesium at the top. This is the salt. And this is the antimony. This thing passes current, the magnesium alloys with the bottom electrode, and then we charge it. It goes back up. Well, this is with that seed money I was able to hire on one student. That's it. That's my team in 2007. That student looks worried. <laughs> he should be. This thing wasn't working. He wasn't sure it was going to work. I didn't tell him, but I wasn't sure it was going to work. But he wanted a PhD. He's young and he's smart. I, you know what mentoring is? You tell them you can do anything. We heard that earlier today. And he did it. Made the first battery. But then in 2009, my luck changed. I got a $4 million grant from Total, a French energy company. And then $9 million from the newly formed ARPA-E branch of the Department of Energy. And with $13 million, I expanded my team to 20 people. Multinational task force of students, postdocs, graduate students, all very smart, all very literate in chemistry and electrochemistry, no battery experience. I taught them how to think about the problem, encouraged them, and then set them loose, and they worked miracles. And why do they work for me? Because they have a sense of higher purpose. They don't want to just get a PhD and write a paper. They want to change the world. They want science and service to society. And that's what this is all about. The liquid metal battery is just the agent of the story. This is about young people who want to change the world, do so with science. And here's some of our results. This is the, the cell that I just showed you. This is about three quarter inch in diameter. It's a one watt hour. I call it the shot glass. We've run hundreds of these cells, exploring different chemistries, different combinations of metals, alloys, and salts. And then to see if this thing can scale, because if it can't scale, it's not going to make it. It's got to be scalable at cost. We went to the hockey puck. I was born in Toronto. So I, you know, it's, it's a hockey puck. Everybody knows a hockey puck is three inches in diameter. This is a 20 watt hour cell. And then this is the saucer, a six inch diameter, 200 watt cell. And this is one piece of technical data. I'm going to show you two piece technical data. This is the discharge capacity as a function of number of cycles. Charge, discharge, charge, discharge. What you take away is fade rate of 0.005% per cycle. And what that means in plain English is 15 years from now, you'll retain 72% of your birth date capacity. There's no battery that can do that today. Right? And we can abuse this thing. This is 1,000 cycles. This battery went 1,000 cycles of deep discharge. And for 200 cycles, we ran at a current density of 1,000 milliamps per square centimeter. For reference, that's 30% more intense than the current density in a modern aluminum smelter. And do you think we destroyed the battery? Well, judge for yourself. This is the, the, out of the starting gate, and this is after the abuse. It looks better after the abuse than before. So this battery gets better with age. Don't you wish we could find one of those for ourselves, huh? So what's the status here? Well, we've tested over 800 cells, different chemistries, and we've got some combinations that are down at $100 a kilowatt hour for the cost of the electrodes and the electrolyte. I've shown you capacity fade of 005. I've got some other data I can't show you just yet, 0.003. That's greater than 75% retention after 15 years. But we weren't satisfied. We want to go faster. So we started a company. My students, 
two of my former students, I started a company. The original name was Liquid Metal Battery Corporation, and this summer we changed the name to Ambry to avoid confusion and so on. And people ask me, how'd you get the name Ambry? Uh, we invented it in Cambridge, so I lopped off the C and the DGE. So there's where Ambry comes from. <laughs> so what are we doing in Ambry? We're scaling. So this I call a pizza. It's 16 inches in diameter and has a storage capacity of one kilowatt hour. It's not full of D-cell batteries. This is one cell, 1,000 watt hours. That's 1,000 times that little cell. And we've got something uh, on the drawing board that's I call a bistro table. It's 36 inches, and it could be square instead of round, and, and that's four kilowatt hours, but I'm not going to tell you about that one just yet. So one design has us aggregating, stacking these uh, bistro tables into modules, and then grouping the modules into a, a giant 40-foot shipping container, and that'd have a nameplate capacity of two megawatt hours. Two million watt hours, which is enough energy to power 200 American households on a daily basis. So I think what I'm showing you here is grid-level storage. It's silent, unlike the diesel generators and the gas turbines. Emissions-free, we're not burning any hydrocarbons. No moving parts, the sound of electrons in motion. It's remotely controlled, which means this thing can take signals from the grid. It can be charging, discharging, and all of a sudden jump in for 15 minutes and do some frequency regulation because you can superimpose electrical signals. And it's designed to the market price point without subsidy. <laughs> well, less than two months ago, um, it was actually September the 12th, to be precise. It was the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's speech at Rice University here in Houston, the speech in which he justifies this nation's decision to go to the moon. Now, when viewed as a metaphor, that speech is about much more than space travel. It inspires us to take on great technological challenges, like grid-level storage at the price point of the electricity market, or uh, electric vehicle batteries that are competitive with internal combustion. My favorite line of the speech, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take some liberties here and paraphrase, and when I look at this image, I say that my students and I choose to work on transformational innovation in electricity storage not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our skills and energies. And that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. Now let's finish the job. Thank you, Don. So what you've described is a stable, low-cost uh, battery that sounds like it could be a lifesaver for our community. And you showed us the, the shot glass and the hockey puck and the pizza. My question is, when are we going to see things on the commercial market? When are we going to get to see the fruits of your labor? The plan is to have uh, commercial-scale prototypes available in the uh, first part of 2014. And what do you envision the future being in 2014? 15 or 2020, what's it going to look like with your batteries? Uh, there is a plurality of futures. There, there are so many different uh, application spaces for this battery. And so how, see, what I showed you, the pizza is a single cell. When you put a plurality of cells, that's called the battery, right? If I hit you once, it's assault. If I hit you many times, it's battery, right? <laughs> yeah. So the battery has many cells. You could actually have a battery of one cell, that's sort of an existential question, but anyways. <laughs> so, um, you know, depending on what the application is, you could have things as small as uh, 20 kilowatt hours in the basement of a home, you could have solar panel or a wind turbine in your backyard, and you could collect energy, and what you don't use, you sell to the grid. So instead of you pay the power company, you get paid by the power company. So you turn your house into a profit center and sell energy to your neighbors, you could put it in 
skyscrapers in, in downtown Houston, downtown Manhattan, and draw electricity in the wee hours of the morning when the demand is low. There are some places in the country where we've got abundant generation, but the transmission lines can't get it to the demand centers. So you say, build more transmission lines. You try to get permitted. Huh? So this could, this is called transmission line deferral. There's so many different uh, uh, applications for this. And last question, what will it take for you to scale this to grid level? Time and money. Okay. <laughs> what, do you have an estimate? Do you have a, a, a thought about what year that would be that you could accomplish that? Well, in, in 2014, it, we'll get it in the hands of a third party for independent verification. And uh, if those tests prove favorable, then uh, it's a resource-limited problem. Spend money on it and accelerate. By the way, these things are assembled in open air. We just weld the stuff. It's really simple. No fab lines, no high vacuum, no special atmosphere. The model is to have this thing go globally by employing people locally. And by the way, these things are really heavy. They come with their own anti-theft device. <laughs> Don, thank you for your work. Don Sadaway.